Hello and welcome to today's ASIP webinar, COVID-19 Webinars for Interventional Pain Management Series Part 3. I'd like to pass the floor over to our first speaker, Dr. Lakshmaya Manchikanti. Dr. Manchikanti, if you're ready, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you all for attending uh, third COVID-19 webinars or Corona epidemic uh, webinar. It is uh, pretty interesting that uh, we are still having very good attendance, even though this is the third one. So the problems continue. We are entering into a phase uh, with new norms. We are going to talk about uh, various issues today, perspective on training and employment for those who are going into residency and uh, also those who are looking for employment and those joining into fellowship. After that, we will have managing stress and avoiding burnout, update on economic issues, return to, of employees to work. Then Hans is going to give a presentation on new norms. As you know, everything is going to change. So this is our new norm. Social distancing, washing your hands, everything else. Now, all the webinars are available on the website at no cost. Uh, past two webinars are available already, and this will be available most likely on Friday. After that, we will have a next webinar on Friday the 17th. We will have a speaker from CMS, Kevin Poe, Sunil Dhandi, we are also going to speak about revenue cycle management, and Amol and I will be updating various issues. Our next webinar will be on Thursday, 23rd, April 2020. We are going to change the times because people from West Coast are asking us to change the times. So it will be 5 to 7 Central Time. Since uh, we are getting closer and closer to starting our practices back, so we are going to start talking about returning to practice, slow and steady, managing patient flow, risk-based starting of the procedures, rather than just uh, getting all our procedures one day and putting all of them together. Marketing and recession uh, by Wellness Hour, Randy Alvarez, financial management, Again, revenue cycle management. We will announce soon about uh, 29th April webinar. Here we go again, this uh, flattening of the curve. Everybody is so sick of hearing this. And this is what it meant, uh, goals of community mitigation. That is where they were coming with 100, 100 to 100, 240 deaths. Hopefully, that number will be reduced substantially. And this is a more interesting type of curve, mitigation and hammer. I think we applied the hammer that uh, coronavirus must be dead by this time, hopefully. And we are flattening, I believe. It is at the peak, and we are not seeing that anymore. We are in the same stage as Italy, Spain, China, all these after their fans, after their peaking. And it looks like we may be 10 days out or uh, nine days away from coming down. That means essentially we will still have about 13, 14 days to May 1st uh, to hopefully start our practices. These are the cumulative cases per 100,000 each all the states. If you look at the bottom states, there, that is where Washington State and California are. They started early, two weeks early than some states like New York, New Jersey, and one week early than some states like Kentucky, Indiana, and these states. So they are already flattening out and they are coming down. Whereas New York is coming down for the last couple of days, I think. New Jersey is still in the same status, so they should start coming down. So these are all actually good signs. And But the picture is not that great. Uh, when we had the first uh, webinar 
on March 27th, we had 3,100 deaths in United States. Now it is almost 11,000. It is a 745% increase. They keep calling that we are number one now. We are not really number one. Actually, we dropped one number. We are number nine in the number of deaths per 101 million population. Again, this is the total cases and deaths in United States, each state. 45% uh, of the deaths are from New York, and significant number is from New Jersey, and Louisiana is number three. So it keeps going on. Some of the states have, we have like less than 60 cases or so in Kentucky, in <clears throat> Illinois, is higher, Indiana is higher. Based on the cities like Illinois is uh, in Chicago, Chicago is in Illinois, the same way that is closer to Indiana, so that will be higher. Ohio is actually less than Indiana because they have started this mitigation hammering a lot sooner than anyone else could imagine. There is a nice book written by Dr. Devi. You all know her. It is only $4.99. It is available on Apple Store, Android Store, Day and Books apps. Uh, it answers a lot of questions, and it is extremely useful for patients. A word about uh, chloroquine. Chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, there are multiple randomized trials, two or three randomized trials, but there are multiple observational studies, especially showing the safety of it. Other day in the lecture, somebody brought up about the prolonging the QT interval and it can cause death. Of course it can, and azithromycin in itself can cause that. The same way methadone can cause that. We still give methadone and we Give, indiscriminately give azithromycin, so-called z -packs. Here, the risk is extremely, extremely low. The studies are showing it is effective, and uh, there are a lot of uh, rheumatologists we have using this uh, many, many years, and larger doses, and very long time. They are not noticing any significant problems until it was brought up by Amit the other day in our the presentation, I almost forgot about it, which I knew before, but I forgot. So it pro does prolong QT interval, so obviously it can cause cardiac arrest if that happens, but the risk is extremely low. If you calculate based on this table, which American College of Cardiology gave, if you are age over 68, that gives you one point. Female sex, another one, loop diuretic. So you keep going on. Below six is considered as low risk. You have to find somebody very high. So if somebody had a acute MI or prolonged QTC, there is no need to give it to them. Or obviously if they are in heart failure because of non-COVID reasons, then we don't give it. But if they are in heart failure because of the COVID, pro probably it will be a good choice to do it. We also have a lot of uh, liberalizations from federal government for us with uh, telemedicine healthcare provider facts. And we still have a lot of confusion on this issue. I keep getting questions over and over again. On Sunday, we had uh, Corona Task Force meeting Sunday night, and they were still questioning about it. Again, we can get paid just doing audio only. Providers also can evaluate beneficiaries who have audio phones only. Next thing is new as well as established patients now may stay at home and have a telehealth visit with their provider. This will allow them to make appropriate payment for services furnished via Medicare telehealth, which if not for the PHE for the COVID-19 pandemic would have been furnished in person. 
So essentially, they want to pay exactly same what they would have paid if the patient came to the office and we spent the time with them. This is a COVID questionnaire we use uh, asking each patient uh, if they have been exposed. So you need to add this to your usual follow-up note. Uh, but follow-up should include just uh, not, hey, how are you, goodbye. It should be a lot more than that. It should include exactly what their pain status is, what their functional status, how much pain relief they have gotten, have they had any complications, is their pain returning, are they on any different types of medications, what is their activities of daily living, sitting, standing, walking, bending, lifting, so on and so forth, and also assess the risk factors like smoking, weight, exercise program, and also assess the interacting factors, morbid comorbidities. If they are on opioids, also are they on benzodiazepines? What else are they on? And how these opioids will be affected? And do, during our this season, many of our patients are on non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents. It is essential to go ahead and stop them and explain to them. We can also give Suboxone, which I don't recommend unless the patient was already induced, but there is an option. There are lots of blanket waivers for healthcare providers. Now, we have been asked, we have been wanting to start new guidelines, I believe. Uh, some of the ASIP members, board members, want this. They want us to come up with our own guidelines, but there are a multitude of guidelines. Uh, they're all based on guidelines from CDC. Now, these guidelines, the one I'm projecting here, are from Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine Society, along with, in conjunction with the European Society of Anesthesiologists, I believe, or Regional Anesthesia. So they are saying chronic pain patients may be more susceptible. They are also saying, of course, all the issues we know, immunosuppression with the opioids as well as steroids. We need to learn to do the procedures without steroids. The only procedures we can do, according, even according to these guidelines, is interthecal refills and malfunction, device infection, deep infection, and explants. Semi-urgent, they include intractable cancer pain, herpes zoster, acute herniated disc, intractable trigeminal neuralgia, complex regional pain syndrome. Again, these all raise a lot of questions. For some people, it is intractable. For others, it may not be. So opioids, we can give for follow-up prescriptions for already existing patients, but we cannot initiate opioid therapy with televisit, it, it cannot be just, definitely cannot be done just with the phone. You should have audio and video and need to avoid the steroids. This is the first support bill came out of Congress signed by President Trump. This is where they get sick, paid sick leave. Then we got the CARES Act, where we have the payroll protection and economic injury and disaster loans. There is also $100 billion or $135 billion for health care. Majority of that money goes into hospitals and others who are affected or treating them for corona. If there is money left over, they can be transferred to the other areas, but I think it will be highly unlikely. We also have expansion of the accelerated and advanced payments program. Here, we can request 100% of the Medicare payment for three months in advance, and which is payable in three months afterwards. We still have the COVID uh, issues some of the audits have been suspended, but some of them are still going on. New LCDs are coming out and new guidelines are coming out. We are re requesting CMS to suspend all onerous audits, 
including asking them to tell other insurers to do the same for three months. There is a CAC meeting regarding facet joint and medical nerve branch procedures. Everybody needs to register for this. If you're a CAC member, you get a different status than a regular member, but either way, it will be important you attend this meeting. They also published consensus practice guidelines on interventions, consensus. That is very important to understand. There is a bill, HR 6365, and the same thing, S33, uh, or 95, that is in the Senate, and this is in the House. This name says that rural healthcare facilities and providers impacted by the COVID-19 emergency, suddenly you may think that it doesn't have anything to do for the doctors. It does include ambulatory surgery centers, healthcare practices, healthcare providers, and physicians. This bill does give you three months worth of collections from last year, and we over a period of three three months, if we collect the same amount of money, then we pay back all. If we collect only half of it, we get pay back only half. But this payment is over a period of two years. Now, we are also trying to get it as a grant, so we don't have to pay it back if that works. This uh, was in the Senate. We, they forgot to put the Senate version number here. But now it is in, also included in the House. Uh, it is really getting up the steam. Hopefully, we will be able to get this out. Only disadvantage could be it is not Nobody is talking about this, but it could happen that this three-month advance you got get from Medicare may be deducted from this. But if it is a grant, you can take this money, pay back to Medicare, and you can keep this one as a grant. So there is an advantage to that. We are also asking CMS to expand this uh, Enhance advancement pro accelerated and advancement payment program to increase the payments by 125% or 25% for three years or 100% for six months. At the same time, we, we are asking them to increase the payment duration, start after six months and take 50% each month for six months rather than 100% over a period of three months. This has a significant potential to be achieved. Now, we, are, we already applied to get this money right now, so it is fine, you can get the money, it doesn't matter. If there is more, they may get you, give you more. But as long as if we can get the payment deferral for a longer period of time, that would help to run the practices and stay afloat. Now, they are also talking about second stimulus, which may be coming soon. That could be part of uh, this, uh, these two bills I was talking about, one in the House, one in the Senate. It is the same bill, of course. There are three, three reasons why some physicians are not burdens. They are not worried about future, their burden is managed appropriately. They find a niche that you, they are passionate about, they stay calm, they are well-rounded. Pam McPherson is going to talk in a little while, but these are the words from Sunil Dhand. He's going to speak on April 17th. So philosophically, Kiss, uh, one of my orthopedic surgeon friends said, keep it simple, stupid. Now, here, as an organization, our goals are to keep you informed, safe, scientific, and secure. Our goals as practitioners is keep it slow and steady. We want to come back slowly and steady. We don't want to jump into these programs and get into trouble. As I said, we are going to have multiple speakers. Now we will have 
Shalini. She is uh, assistant professor and vice chair of the Department of Anesthesiology. She will be speaking on perspective on training and employment. She is also the program director of uh, anesthesiology. She is president elect of California Society of Interventional Pain Physicians. Shalini, here you go. Thank you. So I wanted to thank you, Dr. Manchikanti, and to ASIP for holding this webinar, and specifically for addressing the issues with fellows and trainees in practice. Um, next slide, please. So I wanted to give a little bit of background in terms of what is happening, um, both from an anecdotal perspective as well as from the frontline perspective and the ACGME's response to what fellows are um, going through, what they will be potentially going through in terms of graduation requirements, and what are some advice for employment um, in the future. Um, so next slide, please. So in regards to the ACGME's response, the ACGME has stated that they have three tiers in terms of what they categorize as um, um, trainee response. Number one is business as usual, in the sense that nothing has really changed, no supervision requirements will be amended, um, no change in accreditation, um, essentially business as usual. And we know this is not business as usual. Um, most of the fellows, if not all the fellows in this country, have seen significant drop in the procedural volume caseload. So this is not business as usual, but for all intents and purposes, if your fellows are not being repurposed right now, um, they're considered business as usual. The third category, I'm going to skip the second category for a second. The third category is pandemic status. And this really re applies mostly to the New York programs where the fellows have been repurposed our pain fellows are no longer doing pain procedures, no longer doing telehealth, but they are actually doing ICU work, ER shift work. They're working on the floors. They're doing OR anesthesia uh, for those emergent cases. So that's pandemic status. But for the majority of, of programs, you're either going to be falling in the business as usual program or in stage two, which is there is an increased need for the fellows to do other things besides pain, and let's talk about what that means. And I'm really excited today because we have so many residents and fellows, I can see the audience list in this webinar, and a lot of them, I'll tell you, have never been sat down and spoken to and say, what does this mean for me? Am I going to graduate on time? Do I still need to meet the same number of numbers and competency lists that I had before? What does this mean? Because essentially four months out of 12 months of training is now um, affected, you know, nearly one third of your fellowship. Let's move on to the next slide on overarching themes. So in terms of case two, if your institution falls into case two, what does that mean? Number one, the duty hours will still not be affected. Your fellows still need oversight just like they had prior to the COVID pandemic. 80 hours work week, like we said, still is in effect, but about 20% of the patient or fellows can be repurposed to do non-pain related activity. Okay. So that means 80% of the time they're still doing pain, but 20% of the time they can be doing work in their core specialty. Okay. Let's move on to the next slide. Stage two, um, increased clinical demands. What specifically? What about graduation requirements? I want the fellows that are on this call to realize that any decision, whether you will be repurposed, or whether you will graduate or not, or whether you will have the competencies to graduate or not, lie within your program director and your CCC. Okay, this is not a national decision. This is going to be still a local decision. So the fellowship director will still, in conjunction with the, the CCC, the Clinical Competency Committee, deem whether you have the competency to graduate. And by nine, nine months into the fellowship, I can just about assure that most fellows, if not all fellows, will have the required competencies. Okay? So you should rest assured, if you're a fellow today, that you will have the acquired competency to graduate, provided that you have met your minimums already, and I think most have. You know, this levels the playing field a little bit. All of the fellows are affected. 
all of the fellows essentially will be having nine months instead of 12 months of procedural volume under their belt. So it's not that any one of you is going to be better than the other. You all are on the same playing field. Although the playing field is lower, <laughs> you still are all starting on the same playing field. Okay. So your competencies and your, and your graduation requirements will still be um, determined by your program director, which is a very good thing, which is a very secure thing for you. Okay. Moving on to the case log volumes. One of the things that the ACGME um, and the RSC really want to stress is that the minimums for case volumes are not what determines your competency as a pain physician. Okay, these are minimums. These are just to ensure that you get a nice extensive breadth and case volume and case variety mix, but not that you need a certain minimum. And I want to stress that for you because any fellow graduating from any ACGME program today to will have the required minimums, okay? If you haven't already, I'm sure most of you already do, um, to meet your minimums. So rest assured that you've met your minimums. Now, what is affected is your elective time. Some may not have their elective time. Some may not be able to go on external rotations, um, things like that. That's how you may be affected, but you've met your minimum, so you've met your competency by and large. So the next slide on telehealth. There's a few things I want to understand. I want the faculty, if you have an academic uh, physician practice or if you're a fellow, how does telehealth, what are the compliance rules and regulations for telehealth as it relates to residents and fellows? Okay. The most important things is that, number one, when I do telehealth, for example, I may be sitting at home and my fellow may be sitting at his or her home. Now, how does that interaction work? How does that direct supervision requirement work? So what um, CMS, um, as well as the ACGME recommends, the next slide on telehealth for residents and fellows, is that direct supervision doesn't necessarily have to be there, provided that the resident or fellow discusses the case with the faculty, with the attending. And this is documented somewhere in the note, just like we would have in live visits. Next slide. What about telephone visits? As you know, telephone visits are reimbursed at the same rate as Zoom video visits. So if the re resident or fellow is conducting a phone visit, do I need to um, discuss this case with my uh, resident or fellow or get on the phone with the patient? The answer is no, you do not need to get on the phone provided the resident or fellow has discussed this case with you and it is documented in the chart. Next slide. Continuing on with phone visits, one of the questions that typically comes up is, you know, I run a resident clinic or I run a fellow run clinic only. In some states and some specialties, they allow that. Do I need to co-sign every chart or what are the requirements for that? Provided your trainee has completed six months of training, you, the fellow or resident can have indirect supervision requirements and meet indirect supervision requirements and you are able to compliantly bill for that, for that visit, okay? But provided your resident or trainee has had six months of uh, training underneath them. I want to move on to employment issues. And this is really the crux of the talk. You know, a lot of fellows are graduating in three or four months, and they're worried. Will I have a job to go to when I graduate? Will that job still be there waiting for me when I graduate? I've heard of several fellows, mostly in the Midwest, who have had job contracts in their hands, signed job contracts, which have now been rescinded, meaning the contract has been essentially null and void where the practice tells the fellow, we don't need you anymore. From every standpoint you can imagine, this, is, this has an extreme anxiety uh, element to it. You know, these fellows are graduating with incredible debt and they don't have a job to go to. What do you do? They, we'll go to the next slide, which says bottom line. And the bottom line is, is that if I were a fellow today, what advice would I want? And what advice can I give you or this group of physicians that's on this call can give you so that you have a leg up, okay? Because likely you may not have a practice to go to. You may not have a job to go to. A lot of layoffs are happening, physician layoffs, physician salaries have been cut. I can speak firsthand to that. So I can tell you, what can you do? This is some advice for you, or what advice I could give you so that you do have a leg up, okay? Next slide. 
the overarching thing that I want you to understand is whether you graduated with a traditional fellowship or now with the COVID fellowship, <laughs> is that it will take you two years to get to get proficient enough to fly on your own. And that's the bottom line. No matter what fellowship you think you came from or who you know who you uh, were trained with, you will need two years under your belt. Uh, some fellows are lucky. They'll be joining an academic practice or a practice with a lot of physicians so that they will have that person over their shoulder to give them advice and to guide them. But some of you might be starting your own practice or maybe joining a, a practice in which there's only one other physician on staff and you probably will not see him or her that often. Now, what can you do to be successful, right? Because you have had three or four months less a fellowship time than, than the other fellows that are starting out from last year or the years before. So what can I tell you in order to get you ready to fly? Okay. And this is really from experience. This is my seventh year as being uh, in practice. And I, I look at all my fellows as children. Okay. And I see them and I see how they're very confident when they're just about to graduate. And the day they graduate, they're nervous and they're picking up the phone and they're checking me. How do I do an epidural? What exactly should I just be doing? You know, that, that anxiety comes out that first day, just like when you're an anesthesiologist and the first time you have to intubate solo, you get that anxiety. But it come, it's going to come back to you very quickly. But these are the things that you need to understand. Number one, learning to fly. Okay. It's going to take time. So here's what I would do. If you have downtime and you anticipate your job will not start as July, on July 1st or August 1st as you first anticipated, okay, if you anticipate that you'll probably be starting in November or December, this is the time where you need to um, learn about your state's opiate um, regulations and rules, okay? So, for example, I practice in California, but if I were to take a job in New York, I don't know their state's opiate rules and regulations. What do I need to be compliant? What are the... Uh, steps that I need to go through with the DEA. This is the time to memorize these reg rules and regulations and keep yourself safe so that when you're starting your practice, you don't have to, um, you know, walk with wet feet. The second thing I would say is that this is a great opportunity to take the time and learn that EMR, okay? If you were trained on Cerner, but you're going to a practice that has Epic or Athena Health, this is the time to take those courses. There are free webinars through the EMR vendors that you can learn and um, master the EMR skills. Make those templates, okay? Fine. Write your 20 top procedures that you anticipate doing, your new consultation note, your follow-up note, and make those templates and have them ready to go so that you don't have any downtime. You hit the ground running. The next thing I would do is understand Marketing 101, okay? A lot of people either shy away from it or don't know even how to start that. The way you start that is, look, Find out who's doing what in your community, wherever your job is that you're intending to go to, and who is doing what well. Okay, that's your competition. Who is doing what well? And that's who you need to learn from and find out who, where, where is that landscape, okay? In fact, there are a lot of uh, tools out there. For example, Boston Scientific has a, um, a program called Patient Finder. They can tell you, given your specific disease and your specific zip code, who's their PCP, what therapies they've been through, and it will give you a leg up in terms of how to market yourself, how to market yourself to the right people, how to market yourself as, as the great pain physician in town, or the new guy in town, new gal in town, right? Finally, I'm going to move on and tell you that you do need to find some locums work, and this is the reality, okay? If you're an anesthesiologist, get some um, moonlighting, contracts in your hand, get some locums work in your hand. Anesthesia, we're pretty lucky in the sense that elective cases have taken a hit, but all the elective cases now are waiting to be done. So in about a few months, once the pandemic has slowed down, you can anticipate a burst of anesthesia cases um, and anesthesia work. So find those work now, find the moonlighting options, find the locums uh, jobs. If you are a physiatrist, you may wanna do hospitalist or subacute rehab work. Um, find them and lock them down now. Uh, you need that steady income stream. Sign up for cadaver courses in the fall once the pandemic slows down because some of you who have a not so interventional fellowship are going to need that skill set. Just, you know, cutting down on one or two cases a month is, is going to be big for you. So you're going to have to get those cadaver courses locked in with those, uh, with that STEM vendors. Finally, on documentation. Okay. And I want to stress that this is a great opportunity for you to understand documentation and learn it with your eyes closed, 
Okay. Documentate. Why, why do we document? If you have to understand the concepts, either you're communicating to yourself and for your own records, you're communicating to your referring provider. Remember, you're a consultant. You want to learn how to communicate like an intelligent, well thought out physician consultant. Demonstrate your plan and your rationale for your plan and your rationale for your recommendation. Okay. You also need to document for the pre op process. And this is where you get approval for your services, meaning, how do you document for medical necessity? Learn that. And number four, we document for malpractice, you know, keeping your practice safe. What I recommend in terms of documentation is that you find the 20 co most common cases, and this is something my mentor taught me, find the 20 most common cases that you're most likely to do as a pain physician. Okay, epidural steroid injections, sacroiliac injections, facet, RFA, stim, whatever it is. And you learn those LCDs. Those are local coverage determinations. So each portion of the United States has its own contractor with CMS, and they de delineate what are the elements that you need to demonstrate in terms of medical necessity and documentation to get the service approved and reimbursed. And you should learn that. Learn that and memorize it with your 20 top procedures that you anticipate doing. Okay? Something else that um, <laughs> I wish I had done as a fellow uh, is learn the CMS Part D formulary. Okay, there's no reason to prescribe Medicare beneficiary Celebrex or pregabalin, things that just will not be approved and will be a pre auth nightmare for your staff and for yourself to do the peer to peers. So learn what's on formulary with most of your payers and, and um, have a sense of what will your first line be. If you need an NSAID, given this insurance coverage, this is what my first line neuropathic would be, or this is what my first line NSAID would be, right? Know that by heart. This is your time to get your leg up um, and have very, very strong onboarding skills. Okay, I'm gonna to go to the next slide, which is learning about your limitations. You have to understand that due to the COVID pandemic, you're not, you probably will not be getting the procedural volume that previous fellows have received for 12 months. You're getting volumes that you had for eight months or nine months, okay? But that's okay. As long as you understand that you have a little bit of a limitation, you will overcome it, okay? So this is your time to do your strong onboarding, like we said, get your documentation right, understand your LCDs, um, understand coding, compliance, all the things that go into, into being strong when you come out, okay? I'm going to leave you with some final thoughts. Number one, through this pandemic, and I'm going to give you some very, you know, very earnest advice, is that know what's important to you, and it's your family and your health. God has given you two hands. You will be successful. Okay, having three or four months under your belt less than everyone else is not going to make a big dent in the long run. As long as you're a good doctor first and foremost, that's all that matters. Everything else will come into place. As long as you're earnest and you have interest and you have scientific basis for what you're doing and you believe what the evidence to drive you, in terms of your decision making, you will be fine. And you have to understand that. So maintain positivity, be innovative. You know, like I said, like my mentor taught me, take the 20 top codes that you, uh, procedures that you would be doing and understand that process. Understand those, those pathologies inside and out and what are the options for, for care for those patients. And, you know, you will get through this and I think you will be fine. And at, at any point, I'm, either myself or anyone from ASIP would be happy to walk you through and to give you advice on this. So you don't realize that you have a network out there. Make connections, use that network. Um, I know it's a lot of anxiety right now, but you will get through this. And that's um, what I have for you. Um, and I wish you the best of luck. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Manchikanti. Thank you, Shalini. That was a wonderful presentation. It looks like I want to go back into residency and our fellowship and learn the documentation all over again. So I don't have that much free time actually to learn these things. So we will move on again. Thank you. Our next speaker is Pamela McPherson. She graduated from Louisiana State University School of Medicine in Shreveport. She is uh, associated with, uh, affiliated with University Health Centers. Uh, she specializes in uh, multiple branches of psychiatry. 
today she's going to speak to us about managing stress and avoiding burnout. Here is Dr. McPherson. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manchikanti. We are living and working in a time that is like no other we have ever experienced. This was us just a month ago, working, enjoying life. But our world has changed. How quickly we forget normal. Did you notice your emotional reaction to the photographs? Did you notice your tension increase with the COVID-related photos? Images, social media, and our work cause our body to react. The new information that we are assimilating is reminiscent of medical school and residency for the sheer volume that we are digesting each day. You may be stretched to your physical limit. You may be functioning on the edge. Our limbic systems are in overdrive. A poll by the Kaiser Family Foundation reported that the pandemic has negatively impacted our mental health and the effects are increasing as this fight continues. Stress impacts our physical, emotional, behavioral, and cognitive abilities. Stress causes our energy levels to surge and wane. We are irritable and on edge one minute and feel heroic the next. You may forget to eat or binge and sleep is disrupted or fraught with vivid dreams. For the next few minutes, we will consider the toll that stress can take on physicians personally and professionally, and explore how you might create a personal resilience plan. Resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from stress. And here is what I want you to remember. You are resilient. You haven't come this far without being resilient. Self-care can strengthen your resiliency, allowing you to battle stress and avoid burnout. The one thing you must do is this. You must make time for self-care make self-care a priority. Stress is our physiological response to pressure. Stress can make us stronger. Weight-bearing exercises build muscle and bone density. Navigating hardships makes us stronger too. But stress can take a toll on our physical, cognitive, behavioral, and emotional health, so you must make self-care a priority. Be alert for the signs of stress. Feeling tired, sleeping too much or too little, wild or vivid dreams, muscle tension, irritability, headaches, gastrointestinal distress, overeating, or not eating enough, simply not being yourself. This stress will occur because our normal routines have been disrupted and replaced with chaos. We don't know what each day will bring, and we don't know what information to trust. Chaos and uncertainty are inherently stressful. This pandemic, this segment of our lives, will not last forever. During the height of the COVID-19 outbreak in Wuhan, China, 45 mental health professionals offered peer support and crisis intervention to Chinese medical staff on the front lines. Over social media, these mostly American mental health professionals used their knowledge of mental health and their Mandarin language to seize the moment and help colleagues in China. This, my friends, is resilience in action. 
For this project called Top Gun, mental health professionals were on call 16 hours a day, fielding hundreds of calls. The Top Gun team identified 10 emotional stages of the healthcare professionals in Wuhan. The first was bewilderment, disbelief over the conflicting information. Then came shock, recognizing the danger, followed by anger and anxiety, leading to burnout, facing the struggle simply to survive. This led many to desperation, losing all hope, but they were able to come through with acceptance upon facing reality. They established hope, and finally they entered a period of recovery and restoring normal. The Wuhan Top Gun team has postulated that some will recover fully, but a few may have a long-term impact and develop post-traumatic stress disorder. They also identified intervention techniques for mental health professionals to use in supporting frontline medical staff. Dr. Chang reported that mental health professionals in Wuhan are now supporting medical professionals in the United States. His team noted the importance of validation. Validation, the recognition and affirmation of emotion. Recognizing emotions, including shock, anger, and desperation, while fostering acceptance and instilling hope, leads to recovery. For a very few, those who suffer clinical depression, experience an exacerbation of pre-existing mental illness or substance use, or have thoughts of self-harm, mental health treatment is available. Mental health professionals are working full blast these days over telemedicine. Practicing self-care deliberately is critical to surmounting stress and maintaining your health. And ultimately, practicing self-care deliberately will lead to your recovery. You will recover from this unprecedented moment in your life. Exercise, sleep, a nutritious diet, and friendships are the self-care tools that allow us to manage stress. Even if you normally eat well, get plenty of rest, exercise, and enjoy time with friends, odds are that the pandemic has derailed your self-care. Be aware, set limits that allow you to maintain at least some of your self-care routines and accept my challenge to take the time to think about a new self-care routine that you might begin. Rest, eating well, finding joy, expressing gratitude, music, art, worship. Consider which of these should be part of your personal resilience plan. Let me call out expressing gratitude. As physicians, we are team leaders, the experts. As leaders, we must do two things. We must protect our team, and we must foster growth. Expressing gratitude does both. Saying, thank you for showing up, or I saw what a great job you did, is what our colleagues and families need from us right now. If you do not actively develop your personal resilience plan, if you abandon self-care, you will greatly heighten your risk for burnout. Burnout is defined as feeling exhausted, cynical, cynical to the point of becoming detached from your patient and clinical team. Some describe burnout as feeling utterly defeated, powerless, regretting or questioning why we even became physicians in the first place. As you know, 
burnout simply is not an option for those of us in healthcare right now. We must set the limits necessary to allow time for self-care and recovery. But you should also know that burnout is not a personal failure or personal trait. Burnout is a perfect storm that occurs when we lose sight of our purpose, our meaning, our center. Burnout is a function of the workplace and occurs when we no longer understand our purpose in relation to that workplace. No doubt you were aware of Kroll's 2016 survey of burnout in pain management physicians. Dr. Kroll notes, two-thirds of ACIP members completing the survey reported high levels of emotional exhaustion indicating they find their work draining, stressful, demanding, and frustrating. This was in 2016. Even before the pandemic, some pain medicine physicians were at risk for burnout. Self-care is more important now than ever. So let's get down to the nitty gritty. This is my favorite meme from the pandemic. Unfortunately, I don't know who to credit for this mean, but I hope you'll take time to study it um, in the evening and days ahead. To combat stress and avoid burnout, we must each develop our own plan to strengthen our resilience. In an ideal time, say six weeks ago, we might have spent a couple of hours or more re-examining our work environment and ourselves. Remember the luxury of time, when you have that luxury again, you might want to look at the steps forward. The AMA has developed the steps forward practice improvement strategies to guide physicians through practice improvement. Steps forward addresses improved professional satisfaction, better patient experience, better population health, and lower overall costs with assessment strategies and implementation tools for you to use. But this afternoon, for this short time, focus on how you can take care of yourself. It doesn't have to be an hour at the gym, small steps in the right direction. It can be stretches while you're on a phone call or even while you're listening to this webinar. It can be savoring how good that first sip of coffee tastes or remembering that good coffee as you drink whatever you have available now. You control how you see the world. Use that power. Today, right now, I challenge you to commit to adding one self-care strategy to your toolbox, but don't do it alone. Asking a friend or family member to take the challenge with you will increase both of your accountability. If I had to choose one skill, one most important strategy, one, a one-size-fits-all strategy, the one you can't live without, that would be self-compassion. Now is the time to be kind to yourself. Let go of overly critical self-judgment. While we must fully acknowledge our negative thoughts and emotions and suffering, we must guard against being overwhelmed by emotion. Remember, you control how you see the world. Take a moment to recall a favorite mentor or friend, that person who made you a better version of yourself, Someone who saw you as you are, accepted you, saw your talents, and nurtured them. When you internalize that spirit and use that voice to guide you, you are accepting your humanity and practicing self-compassion. In closing, I would like to offer these resources for you to view later. I wish you all physical and mental health, and I thank you for your time today.
Thank you, Pam. Uh, that was a great presentation. I think we are going to invite you as our keynote speaker at the annual meeting. And I'm really <laughs> shocked that you used my picture in your lecture. <laughs> that is very impressive. That means you really worked hard at it to find all this information. So it was great. So I'm sure there will be questions for you in a few minutes. Now we go back to go on to Amol Sai, and I'm saying back because we have been there himself and I both have been there for every webinar. So he's going to update again on economic issues and how we can survive. Pam just told us how we can survive the psychological burnout. Now he's going to show us how we are going to survive economic burnout. Amol? Yes, thank you, Dr. Manchikani. Uh, so I'm going to provide an update on some of the business and economic act aspects and uh, tips for survival of our practice uh, practices financially, um, hopefully provide some new or update information from the previous webinars. But again, uh, just to disclose, you know, I'm not a lawyer or a banker or an accountant, so it's important to um, consult those people. So let's talk about some immediate options or stuff that you should be doing um, right now. Uh, one thing that I wanted to mention I did not mention on previous webinars was about the SBA Disaster Loan Grant. Um, as you may have heard, $10 billion was set aside for small businesses who need immediate assistance. And that immediate assistance is the, in the form of a forgivable $10,000 grant. Um, if you have not applied for this and you own your own practice or own a small business, um, even outside of your practice, you may be eligible for this grant. I left the link there, but basically it's covid19relief.sba.gov. It only takes you 10 minutes to fill out this uh, application form. Uh, and the very last line, you include your checking and routing number for your bank. And then the last thing you check is a box that you attest that you would like to be considered for one of these um, $10,000 grants. Uh, something to consider doing. Um, when the program first came out, they were saying that they wanted to provide this capital immediately to help keep businesses afloat saying that if you applied, you would get this funding within three business days. I applied on April 1st. It's now April 7th. I haven't heard anything, uh, but I know a lot of businesses were applying for that, but it might be good to get into that queue. Um, here's what it looks like, that website, just a screenshot from my phone, uh, when you first start the application process for that grant. Now, if you do get that grant, um, that $10,000, and if you do have it as a forgivable option, you would have to subtract that $10,000 from the payroll paycheck program if you get that as well. Um, so let's move on again to Medicare Advanced Payments. I know Dr. Manchi uh, Conti um, touched on this, but this is a very fast option for capital. Uh, it works as an interest-free bridge loan. Uh, Medicare has been very responsive. Uh, actually, when I submitted my form, I got an email confirmation confirming that they um, got my application in one business day. Um, that's how it was for us in Ohio. And in that email, they stated that it's a seven-day turnaround. Um, each state is different, so you have to contact your carrier, your MAC, but the basic uh, guidelines of the program are 120-day payback based on future billings up to 210 days to uh, to pay back your um, your um, interest-free uh, loan or advance. Here's the application in its entirety. It's literally one page, um, so it's not very difficult to figure uh, to fill out. Um, there's just um, questions in there about your previous uh, collections from Medicare and about how much you want as an advance. Um, and then there's an email address on the bottom that you have to submit it to. Uh, this is for our particular carrier in Ohio and Kentucky, um, although I think most forms are pretty similar. Um, let's move on to the Paycheck Protection Program. Again, just to briefly update, because we have talked about this on previous webinars. As you know, it's fully forgivable if you meet requirements. Um, you must keep your employees on payroll. You have an opportunity to rehire them. Uh, what you need to apply, uh, basically, the SBA uh, 
has a max loan amount of two and a half times one month your payroll, and you have to fill out this official form 2483. Um, this is what it looks like right here. This is the official uh, form uh, from the SBA. Uh, it's only three pages long as well. Uh, there's a little rubric um, that you can see uh, with uh, three boxes there in the top third of the um, the application that lists the number of employees um, and your average monthly payroll, two and a half times that uh, to get your maximum loan amount, and you also have to check boxes on what you use it for. Uh, I applied through this through one of my banks. Um, they had this online, basically, survey thing that you fill out. It was eight or nine pages where you um, typed in a bunch of things and uploaded documents, and then after you finished their survey, it actually auto-populated this SBA form uh, for me to sign in ink, and then I had to scan and upload that as well as my ID. Of course, all banks are asking for different things, uh, but really, in reality, all the SBA really cares about is um, your payroll reports, although banks are free to ask you for other information. But you would just contact your commercial lender if you wanted something like that. There's also the SBA disaster loan option that's different than the uh, Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, you can get up to $2 million as determined by the SBA based on your ability to pay it back. You can use it for working capital for operations, paid sick leave, payroll, um, increased material loss uh, costs due to supply chain changes or, or to pay obligations due to revenue loss, rent, mortgage, um, for example. Uh, collateral uh, can be will be taken on loans uh, over twenty five thousand dollars and a guarantee on loans over two hundred thousand um, dollars. That's different than the Paycheck Protection Program where they don't require those things. Uh, you do have an interest rate with that, 3.75% for businesses. There's no participation or prepayment fees, and the term's not to exceed 30 years. Uh, as I mentioned, up to 10000 can be forgivable as a grant. Now, you can just accept the grant uh, of $10,000 if you apply for it, as I mentioned um, early on in my talk here today, uh, and not apply for the SBA disaster loan. And you can apply for that $10,000 grant, which is kind of a no-brainer just to do it. Um, and you can also apply for uh, the PPP in addition to that $10,000 there. Here's what the uh, SBA disaster loan website looks like. Um, I just, you know, he literally can Google SBA disaster loan. Uh, for one of those loans, you actually apply through the uh, Small Business Administration. You do not go through your commercial lender. Uh, you can also have the option of getting no assistance from the SBA or the government, uh, considering letting your employees go on unemployment. Um, that's not as terrible as it may have been in the past due to um, some improvements with federal funding of state programs. The options vary based on your state. Ohio, for example, has a specific number for all COVID-19 employees who are laid off during the crisis. So when you typically apply for unemployment, you go to a website your employees do, and there's like a specific number uh, associated with your business. However, in Ohio, for example, they have just one number for every single employee laid off from COVID-19. And you want to do something like that in your state so that it's not held against you um, for um, if you somehow get any type of, of punishment or, or extra payments due um, due to uh, laying off employees. So you have to check with your state on that. Uh, the maximum amount uh, an employee can get uh, is about 50% of their uh, total payroll up to a $533 a day max um, up to $113,000 a year in Ohio. Uh, of course, other states may vary. This is what it looks like in Ohio. I'm sure other states are very similar, but you would just, you know, perhaps Google unemployment in the name of your state, and uh, typically claims are filed weekly. There's also a payroll tax deferral option. Uh, what that does is allows you to defer um, your payroll taxes. Uh, you still have to pay them. Uh, you can just defer them to a later date. This is designed to help larger employers, right? So the Small Business Administration stuff counts from businesses that have 500 or less employees. Um, there's, you know, leaves larger cor corporations with less freedom uh, to get some of those uh, incentives. Um, so the payroll defa tax deferral option is also another way to um, to help. So summary of options in no particular order. Um, you can look at the SBA 7A, the Paycheck Protection Program, which is a good one because if you can uh, get the forgivable loan option, it essentially functions as a grant, uh, although that program has been slow to launch, and I know a lot of us have applied for it and are still going through the process. There's the SBA Disaster Loan, uh, the Medicare Advance Payments, which is incredibly easy to do. Um, the SBA Disaster Grant, which is something that I do recommend um, you filling out and getting in line for. Uh, the payroll deferral options, should you choose to do that. 
uh, and you can always uh, consider patient, uh, placing your employees on unemployment. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there for us that are struggling or may be struggling in the coming months once our billing starts to um, change since a lot of us are closed or shut down right now. Um, so, you know, it's important to tr take advantage of things that are out there for you. Um, in other words, it'd be unfortunate for you to suffer financially if you didn't take advantage of all these programs. Um, and that is the update for today. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Manchikani or Dr. Shaw. Thank you, Amol. That is a good reminder. This is one of the subjects we keep questioning, getting questions over and over again. So please apply as soon as you can, otherwise there may not be any money left. Now, Shalini is back. She's going to discuss about returning to work of healthcare professionals with uh, confirmed or suspected COVID-19. So, Shalini? Thinking. Because it's so easy to talk about what's happening to us in the present, but not thinking about the, you know, the future in terms of when the pandemic is over, how do you decide who you're going to bring back and how you're going to bring back and how are you confirmed that they are safe to come back? So just a few slides to talk about some strategies. These are um, effective as of April 6th. So remember, all guidelines are fluid and they're changing. So this is the latest guidelines in terms of how do you determine when to bring back your healthcare worker, your front office staff, your back office staff, your resident, your fellow, whoever it is. And there are two major strategies. Number one is the test-based strategy, okay? So test-based strategy, we're going to exclude you from work until you don't have a fever, and you have a, meaning you don't have a fever in the absence of using fever-reducing agents. You have improvement of your respiratory symptoms as well as negative results of the molecular COVID assay, okay? And you need two consecutive nasopharyngeal swab specimens collected 24 hours apart, meaning a total of two negative specimens to confirm that you are COVID negative, okay? So A, you don't have symptoms, the symptoms have resolved, and B, you have two consecutive tests that tell you you are negative, you are safe to return to work. What about the non-test-based strategy? Um, you are excluded from work, okay, for at least three days, if at least three days have passed since your recovery, meaning you're fever-free, your respiratory symptoms have abated, and it's been at least seven days since the first symptoms have appeared. Okay, so this is not using any testing methods. Some people have no access. Some, I'll tell you, some occupational health offices from some hospitals are not even allowing healthcare workers to be tested, quite frankly, or the process to be tested is so burdensome. So if you don't have access to testing, you can use a non-test-based strategy. More than 72 hours of symptom-free, plus it's been at least seven days since your first symptoms appeared. How do you monitor and manage now these personnel that's come back? Um, are they going to go back out again? Um, what kind of policies do we need to put into place? So you need to make sure that your healthcare facility, and whether you're in private practice, solo practice, medium-sized practice, or even a large institution like a university, you have to have sick leave policies for healthcare professionals that are non-punitive, that are flexible and consistent with health best practices. And this is something that's really different for us in healthcare. Historically, you know, if I have a fever, if I'm coughing, we still show up to work because there's such a stigma associated with doctors not showing up to work that you're trying to take a day off or whatever it is. And that came from our residency training. But I think through this COVID pandemic, we're realizing that we need to put ourselves and our health of ourselves first as well. And it's okay to do that. So, you know, we need to have sick leave policies. Most of the time, at least I can speak for myself. If I'm sick, it comes out of my vacation. I don't, doctors don't get sick days, right? So it's, you know, nurses get sick days, um, APPs get sick days, but we don't. Um, so we need to have a sick leave policy and advocate for a sick leave policy that's specific and different than a vacation policy for physicians. And you may also want to contact your county or your health um, public health authority for their guidance. Some counties have specific guidance on terms of what their determinants are, whether you can return back to work, and then how long do you monitor these, um, these workers when they come back. You want to also train and educate your healthcare personnel, okay? So meaning it's been some time. Sometimes it's been three weeks, four weeks, uh, you know, a month since 
any healthcare, that professional has been back in the healthcare setting. So it's almost like onboarding again, you know, getting them back up, um, being efficient, um, and h- how to have proper hygiene. Like wash your hands, and we have a strict policy of washing hands or gelling between patients. And they just maybe need a re- uh, refresher trainer. They may also need refreshing on how to don and off the PPE. So that's what the next slide is. I think we've all seen it. Most of us have become very proficient about it. And the guidelines are constantly changing in terms of what we need and what we we should be using, what we have available. Uh, the preferred is with the N95 or higher respirator, with the face shield and a gown and non-sterile gloves. However, acceptable alternatives, depending on what's available in your facility, can be a regular face mask, with face shield, non-sterile gloves and a gown. Okay. Hand hygiene, uh, common sense, right? Before and all contact with patients, before you put on and after removing your PPE, um, make sure your alcohol content, alcohol um, gels have at least 60 to 95% alcohol, or you wash your hands for at least 20 seconds. Um, And make sure that it's readily available um, at, at every location that you may have a point of contact with patients. So at this point, I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Manchikanti, uh, and um, he may have some question and answer period for this. Thank you, Shalini. We will go into question and answer period later. Right now, we have none other than Hans Hansen presenting what are our new norms. This is a dynamic subject, dynamic world, dynamic situation. And he is going to present. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to start by saying, um, can you put my slide up, please? I only have one slide. Um, (laughs) Thank you. Uh, One more. Uh, Keep going. (laughs) One more. Maybe one more. Okay. Yeah, let me just start here. Okay. I'm going to just say, uh, yeah, I know. We, um, we've we been here before, and I'm just going to reflect on two comments. If I could say a take-home thought for all of us is be careful with I think it, therefore it is. Be sure we have evidence and we make sure that we don't take a leap that we're unprepared for. Interventions, immunosuppression, steroid, we're going to we're going to learn this. The other one is you can't practice in fear. Practicing in fear, you either undertreat or you overtreat and you make mistakes. So, maintain what you do, the right thing for the right reasons. A very level stable uh, process of thought and have processes in place for your staff to understand what you're thinking. All right, and HIV. When I was in training, this thing came along, HIV. We didn't know what it was. It it was called AIDS, it was caused a lot of things. You can look up on Google what the risk factors were. There were risk factors, four of them. Uh, One of them was patient, and that's ridiculous. Uh, Again, I think it, therefore it is. We've evolved. What happened after HIV is we had the evolution of HIPAA. We had um, universal precautions evolve. So, I mean, those are good things. SARS, that was, that was tough. That came out of China, too. And although HIV killed many more people, SARS was tough. The Chinese helped us on that one. Then came H1N1. That's, that's swine flu. And a bunch of people got it, but we did okay with it. Um, That came out of Mexico. So now we're here with COVID. Uh, It's been estimated by Fauci that we're going to have 100,000 or more deaths. Well, I don't know. We we shall see. All right. So where the misery lives. We've been humbled. That was a comment made today by Jerome Adams, our Surgeon General. And Fauci said, we may never return to pre-COVID activities. All right, let's just, let's look at the big picture. What do we have in common with others that are hurting? Where's the misery? Well, let's take a restaurant. 
We are a lot like them. They're in carnage right now. They can't do what they do best. And that's the same with us. We're being limited, but it's temporary. We both operate on small margins. Our employees rely on our leadership. We have got to have good management in place and leadership that is predictable. We want good contact and never lose our employees or our clients or patients. And we want to give us a good service. And that that's what we're all about. I mean, insurance companies kind of owe us that a little bit too. All right. We also rely on congregation. The problem we're going to have is we still don't know when we can put on meetings. We really want the ASIP meeting to go off in September, and we really hope it will. <clears throat> but there's other meetings. FSIP is coming up in July. What are we going to do there? We have those questions to answer. I think we'll still be doing them because we're going to do things different in the office. We're going to space people better. It's going to interfere with the office flow and possibly profit. Think about a restaurant. They have to spread people out more. That's less tables. That's less activity on a small margin. And we're going to have to restart. Um, we're going to have fewer patients. We know that. And like Lack said, it's very wise to do uh, a walk before you run. We are in a new territory. We're figuring out what we're doing with HIPAA, telemedicine, and we're going to be using our telephone. You know, smartphones are cool. Uh, we should be using them more. And it's more ac access to care. Access to care in the elderly or those that live in rural areas like where I'm at will be greatly enhanced. And I've done some telemedicine, and I'm, I'm pretty kind of impressed. But we need to start restart these systems. Um, I think these webinars are great. It's really helping us here. Uh, it's helping us understand and communicate with each other, and we're doing it safely. All right, we're not politicians. Healthcare decisions need to be made by those in healthcare. We're, we might see that as a, as a positive spinoff on this is regulations, new regulations are going to require need. And we're going to see some of these old regulations probably say we don't need them because we're learning. And telemedicine is, I guess, the best example there. We're a business oriented healthcare system. We have to think of us as a business. There is no uh, quick turnaround in any business. And we just have to understand that. We're also public health, right? We're um, a, a facility that the public believes will be there and wants us to be there. But I can tell you, I didn't realize I didn't need a waiting room. We're not using our waiting room. And it's, it, it might show us we can reduce our overhead. So tech meets medicine. The medicine can come into your home now, but the downside of that is we might have an 18 hour day because people can get a hold of us too easily. We need to share and support each other. So I pretty much will end again by saying, if we practice by I think it, therefore it is, all the misconceptions on HIV, SARS, swine, and all the other things we've been through are gonna be a problem with COVID. But COVID will find its way, so don't practice in fear. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. That was wonderful, inspiring. As Hans said, that we are going to have many of these uh, discussions, and uh, starting from next week, we are going to discuss mostly how we are going to return to the practice safely based on the available signs without getting ourselves and our patients into trouble. Hans was saying the other day that most of the times we don't know that we are in trouble and until after six months or so, you will see about 14 lawsuits slapped on you. That is what happened in China. The first COVID patient had surgery and there were 14 or 16 people involved. They didn't get sued though because all of them died. So including the doctors, patients, everybody died. So so starting with the first question, this is for uh, Nilesh. My medical assistant is exposed to COVID positive spouse. She is asymptomatic and wants to work. At present, she is working from home 
but we are opening our office next week when can she come back to work nilesh yes uh, can you guys hear me yes wonderful so dr manchi kanthi as always thank you for doing everything that you do for our specialty um and before i start answering any questions i just want to make sure that there is a disclaimer here uh, my answers are timely as of uh, today but the situation is fluid as dr shah said and you need to be cognizant of that at the moment we don't have enough testing and ppe but by the time we open our practices in june july um, that that situation is going to change the, the guidelines are going to change um and essentially what i'm going to tell you is for education and information it's not intended to replace the policies that you may have local authorities uh, directives that you may have the cdc guidelines so you should consult your own physicians and uh, your own attorneys as uh, amul had uh, uh, said previously so let's look at this first case right this is the case basically of an asymptomatic uh, person uh, but person is at high risk so even though she's asymptomatic she could be sharing the virus for up to 14 days and so if for this person as long as they are they're off for 14 days without any symptoms you can have them return to work and that's as of today and this is partly based on what happened in china and in korea in china as of today uh, if you were in wuhan as you returning from other cities back to wuhan you self quarantine for 16 days and if you remain asymptomatic you can go to work and we know that that strategy is working and that's the reason why the cdc has adopted this next okay, question thank you thank you nilesh uh, the next question goes to i guess me on the last webinar exosomes was mentioned for treatment can this be please be expanded on and as for the amniotic msc treatment is there a paper on this submitted as well there is a paper submitted it is published and that is the paper we are using as a standard when we are going to the fda and uh, senate offices and multiple places since uh, our last lecture there have been several stem cells have been approved now we are hoping to get approval for umbilical cord expanded stem cells along with exosomes so our application includes both of them both of them have been applied for ind and we are asking them to get it approved on a rapid basis uh, fda just issued a new rule uh, last night it is called uh, t t cap coronavirus treatment acceleration program to introduce therapies faster so we are hoping that that would help us uh, to go for that and the article is published in pain position it has been on pubmed for a couple of weeks now okay next question would it be appropriate to limit our highly compensated doctor salaries to uh, 8000 something per month until normal cash flows resume uh, this will be for a mole a mole yes thank you a uh, great question and it's an interesting question because uh, the question is would it be appropriate to limit um salaries and and that's a little bit difficult to answer um but the question is is it legal or are you allowed to do that i think would be um i think what you're getting at um i think it depends on your employment contract with that particular physician uh because you don't want to get yourself in any legal trouble by uh changing salaries like that if you're not legally allowed to based on your contract that you have with that physician so i would check that first um i do know practices in my region uh southwestern ohio in particular that there was a practice that um lowered the salaries to $8000 a month for a, a physician that was making around um $30000 a month uh the way they accomplished that was they told the um physician that he can either sign an addendum to his contract or he would be placed on unemployment uh and if he was placed on unemployment the maximum he would be able to get would be $113,000 so he was going to elect to go that route but then the 
doctor who owned the practice came back and said, fine, he would lower the salary to $125,000 annualized. Um, so it is possible to do it if you have an open-ended contract that allows you to adjust salaries like that. If not, you would probably have to have them sign an addendum uh, to do that. Um, but also consider the other options that I mentioned um, in the talk, you know, potentially furloughing or, or doing unemployment if you're shut down. Um, because if they did that in your state that's similar to Ohio, they would actually make more money that route than the 8333 a month that you mentioned. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, there is a question. When using telemedicine, is it customary to collect the copay? I have one commercial carrier telling their subscriber that the copay is waived. Uh, generally, everybody is waiving copays. That doesn't mean that you can't uh, get paid. The insurer is paying you the copay. In this case, if they, they don't want to pay, but they are telling the patients that it is uh, it is inappropriate on their part and you should be still be able to bill because many of the times they co their copay is uh, $75 and for a level 3 visit your approved payment is somewhere between 60 and $70 so all of your payment is going to be in copay essentially you should collect that uh, anybody else wants to comment on that amol shalini I can comment. I can tell you that I've run this through a compliance office, and it's absolutely normal and customary to collect your copay and your deductibles. Nothing has changed, at least that's true here in California. So um, you can still collect even using telehealth. So you are working at a university. You are involved with so much in billing. <laughs> yeah, I watch it. Well, I watch it. <laughs> All the web advantages are gone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the next question is, this is for Nalesh. Uh, my OR circulator has cough, fever, and fatigue, and she has called her PCP, who suggested that she gets a test, and she has been tested at a drive through but is awaiting the test results. Can she return to work, and when? So again, this is a person who is symptomatic, uh, and so you have to presume that the patient person has um, COVID. We're waiting for the results. So you, you would have to have her stay out until he or she is completely well and free of symptoms for at least 72 hours without the use of medication and a minimum of 72 hours. Uh, of course, if you get the results of the test, then that changes uh, uh, the whole thing. Remember that one test is even if it's positive or negative, it's not always reliable. So if it's a negative, they want you to repeat the negative within uh, after after 24 hours before you accept the results because of the false negatives. So this person would still be home for at least seven more days, uh, minimum seven seven days uh, and 72 hours. Okay, thank you. The next question is, what modifiers or codes we can use for telephone follow-up for patients? We just use regular codes like 99213, etc., and either a modifier 95 or modifier GT. Those are the two modifiers based on your insurance. Uh, you can use either one of them. If you use telephone codes, you don't get much paid, so... If you don't want to get paid, you can use any code you want to, but if you want to get paid, just use the regular codes. The next question is, Ann Glazer, how are other providers handling medication patient UDS during the crisis? We are not doing any uh, UDS during the crisis, and I think it would be okay, and they actually, FDA, DEA, all of them have liberalized the rules and regulations and they are even suggesting that we can give additional doses of opioids, not to very high doses. If somebody is on 20 milligrams, we can increase to 30 milligrams or 30 milligrams to 40 milligrams, not somebody on 200, make them 400. But right now, we are, nobody is doing any 
drug testing and it has been only like three weeks since we have been closed so we may be closed for another three weeks or eight weeks based on your perspective so we had to go without any drug testing at this stage what do you think uh, anyone amol shalini yeah, sure. I'm happy to weigh in. Um, you know, I, I learn things from looking at what other people are doing on social media. Um, people are very free and, and stuff social sometimes with what they post. Um, and, you know, I, I've seen some doctors post some interesting things. Like like I saw one physician post that while he's sending uh, home, you know, or, or mail urine drug tests that people can do at home and then has telemedicine where they show the cup, you know, this, and you could do that. And I know I, I've heard of other people doing pill counts via telemedicine, which is probably labor and time intensive. Surely you could do that as well. But the question, if you do those things, is if you're actually going to get any actionable intelligence, because there's so much finagling that can go on. I'm not so sure it's of significant value. I think the important thing is just to document document, um, you know, being vigilant. In Ohio, they suspended all the rules, except you have to check our PDMP or prescription drug monitoring database. And at a minimum, you know, whether that rule has been relaxed or not in your state, I would highly suggest you do that. Um, you could also do opioid risk tool assessments, you know, surveys, et cetera, uh, that patients can fill out for this short term time being. And then once the restrictions are lifted, then yes, I would, I would suggest uh, continuing with your normal protocol of urine drug screens um, and pill counts. Etc. Yeah, this okay. is Hans. Okay. We uh, we still um, we still get the specimen. I do enough suboxone. We've got to do it. It hasn't been a problem. They're they're isolated on their way in and their way out, and they're pretty much given a cup and they go back out to their car. And it it really hasn't been a big challenge, but. It's kept the continuity going, and I'm still seeing the cocaines, and I'm still seeing the bad stuff. So I think we're going to have to keep doing it to some extent. Some people I send to LabCorp. I just say, you got to go to LabCorp. And then we have a telemedicine conference. Did you go? Well, no, I didn't go. Well, no ticking, no laundry. So. Well, that is a little bit too harsh, and we just don't trust people in these days. We have to be a little bit more concerned and compassionate, especially when all the bureaucrats are relaxing the rules. They don't relax on doctors. As I said, audits are still going on. We just got a request for a 310 chart audit from us. That looks like every patient we have on United Healthcare. So, okay, I have a long question here for Pam. Uh, can you read that, Pam, from uh, Griselles, Dario Griselles? Yes, so um, I was very happy to see Dario's um, question about moral injury because this was one of the things that I didn't have time to get to today. We hope to teach physicians to recognize moral distress, the, the psychological and the physical um, distress that can come from being in a situation when one is constrained from acting on what one knows to be right. This is a distress that we can feel um, when we plan a treatment plan for a patient, but then because of insurance companies or because of situations in hospitals, we're not able to carry out what we know would be best for our patient. Um, we want to teach physicians moral agency, how to work through moral distress, um, to develop moral efficacy, moral courage, and moral imagination to be able to cope with moral distress and hopefully not experience moral injury. This is a, a very important area of research. It began with um, nurses back in the um, 1980s, but physicians have seen the, um, the value of recognizing the concept of moral distress and teaching um, residents, teaching physicians how to cope with moral distress. Some hospitals are even establishing teams to assist with moral dilemmas to um, reduce burnout. 
in hospitals. So I'm very thrilled to see this question, and I hope um, you will look into this issue of moral distress and moral injury more, because it's very critical for physicians to understand. Yeah, we used to have many lectures on this from Jim Giordano on moral authority, et cetera, a few years ago. Probably we need to revisit that. Uh, thank you for asking the question, and Pam, thank you for being here and answering such a wonderful lecture. Now, the next question is to Nilesh and Shalini, I believe. My scrub nurse was exposed to COVID positive relative, and she is now symptomatic but cannot get tested. Can she return to work and when? So I, I can take that one. Uh, and it, so this employee has the symptoms of respiratory tract, tract infection, right? And uh, we don't have a definitive diagnosis or an alternative diagnosis such as influenza. So she may return to work after a minimum seven days, but not until she is completely symptom free for 72 hours without use of medications. And that's interpreting the CDC guidelines. Uh, as of uh, uh, this morning. Shalin, do you want to take that? Yes. So she, she say that one more time. Did you want to answer that? Or add to that? You're talking about the lady. No, the question I understood. So you're saying the lady or the nurse who wants to come back to work but was unable to get tested or or um, right. or have Continue definitive proof. Yes. Right, so that would be, more. that would go under the non-test strategy, right? So she's three days fever-free or symptom-free, and it's been at least seven days since her symptoms started. That's the alternative strategy in which she doesn't have access to testing. And that's, uh, most hospitals are using that strategy as well for those who cannot, their OCK health is just so burdened and you can't get in. Um, so most, so a lot of facilities are using a non-testing strategy. Okay, thank you. The next question is, many colleagues became ill in February and early March before testing was available. One colleague even had a CT scan findings later described as consistent with COVID-19. Should individuals who were ill during February get antibody testing? Uh, Nilesh and Shalini. So, I'll defer that. Dr. Patel. Sure. Yes. Um, there is no need to get testing. If the pa person is asymptomatic, what difference is it going to make, right? They've recovered from their COVID infection. Now, we do know that there are going to be some significant long-term consequences, cardiac and pulmonary, because of the, the issues that COVID has with the, the heart and lung. We also know that the COVID receptor is the ACE2 receptor, which is primarily found in the epithelium of the uh, respiratory tract and the GI tract. So a lot of these people will continue to have symptoms. So my question would be, are you symptomatic? Uh, as, a, as an example, do you still have cough, fever, chill, fatigue, loss of smell, loss of taste, any GI symptoms? If you continue to have those symptoms, then you shouldn't return to work. But if, if you are symptom free, you had the COVID at least two, three weeks ago, it's unlikely that you're shedding the virus and so you, you are able to return to work. And there's no need to do serology testing. Now let's talk a little bit about testing. There are two kinds of testing, right? One is a molecular testing that is a PCR test that tells you if you are shedding the virus or if you have the virus currently. The other one is a serology testing, and that test is, I, is IgG uh, that develops the antibody that develops in your body after exposure to, to coronavirus. So your body is already immune. Doing a serology test, you can do the test and then it'll confirm that, that, that you have the appropriate immunity. Uh, but I don't think that's going to make a difference in terms of whether the person comes back or not. I don't think at the moment we have enough tests that we want to waste on, uh, on asymptomatic people. Now, this will change in two, three months' time when testing is more, much more ubiquitous. So here's the question is in relation to the antibodies. Uh, so probably this person may want to donate the blood if he has antibodies. So, so should he get tested for antibodies rather than COVID? So. 
uh, if uh, he you already answered that part I, I didn't understand it right so i didn't answer the part in terms of should he donate the antibodies yes you can donate your plasma and there are some labs that can uh, take the plasma out and use it to treat other people uh, i don't know if any labs uh, in the us uh, that are doing this routinely apparently there is one uh, in new jersey um, and yes yeah, absolutely L look at the question uh, from that perspective, we're always willing to help our patients. Now that I've had COVID, I'm willing to help my my fellow uh, human beings, and this is this is our calling at, at at our core as doctors and healthcare providers. Well, there is a cardiologist uh, in on a ventilator in Cincinnati now. He's looking for antibodies, so, and we are trying to get him uh, some mesenchymal stem cells or exosomes, uh, nothing is happening, nobody is uh, helping him. So these things can be very significant. Uh, look at the Prime Minister of England and he's suffering. So even if it helps, if it is anecdotal or even placebo response, the, somebody in this, uh, Randy Alvarez introduced, interviewed me yesterday. He was saying, what difference does it make if it was placebo? It still works 35% of the time, I will take it. So that is our situation here. So we can't really look at placebo and these differences. And if he does have antibodies, and I think if he, he wants to donate it, that will be very admirable. And he should do that, and we should all encourage that person. And the next question is, what recourse do I have if my university suddenly cut my pay 50% due to COVID? Amol? Yeah, um, great question. Um, you know, it really depends on the contract that you signed and what's in there. Um, so the first suggestion I would have is to look at that. Um, secondly, uh, it might be good to consult with an employment attorney. Um, oftentimes they can review it um, in one or two hours, so it's not too large of an expense uh, to provide you a menu of options. Um, if you didn't sign any addendums or anything like that, uh, you may have some ability to push back, but it really depends on your actual contract. So you may have recourse uh, and, and you may have none, depending on how that contract's written, and I'll turn it over to uh, Shalini. You know, one of the things that I was having a discussion with this morning with someone is that in this era of COVID, it's, I, I hope the institution of healthcare changes because, you know, physicians on the front lines and then they cut the salaries. I mean, that is called exploitation and it's happening. Um, so, you know, one thing I wish is that administrator salaries get really looked at with a very, very close eye and closed lens because it's going to be hard to justify their salaries uh, given that they don't provide any clinical care. But it is happening. I know this firsthand. Uh, physician salaries are being cut, um, especially when we're just about to surge here in California. And I don't know what the recourse is. Um, you know, everyone wants to move it up. The chairman wants to say it comes from the dean's office. The dean's office wants to say it comes from the CEO. No one wants to take accountability from who made this decision and why. Um, I don't know from an employment standpoint or an attorney standpoint or a legal standpoint who has recourse and what the rights are, but I can tell you there is power in numbers. You know, if you get enough physicians who are affected by this and you made a, make a loud enough voice within your institution, you can make some change. Um, but from a legal aspect, I don't, I don't know what advice to give. Uh, but I know that, you know, getting physicians to band together and, and have a consolidated voice helps. On a word of caution, uh, not a caution, but a lot of people, they don't even realize that when they are signing these contracts, but they said there is a possibility that they can get anyone they want to, and they can put any clauses they want to. So we found, I found that one of the hospitals had a clause there, employment clause, that they can reduce the salary by 50% if uh, there is a disaster happening. I don't know how specific they were, but this is a disaster. And uh, attorney told them, told this person that there is no recourse in that case. So if the, a clause like that exists, then we 
can't do anything. But addendum is different. You just don't sign the addendum. So if somebody mm -hmm. asks you to sign one. Okay, next question is, I, my PA helps me procedures and has had influenza virus test positive. When can he return to work? So this is a straightforward one, right? This is a respiratory tract infection uh, with an alternative diagnosis of influenza. So in this case, once a person is feeling completely well, uh, he or she can return to work as long as they've been at least 24 hours without any symptoms of medications. Uh, no different to how you would treat uh, a regular influenza. Thank you. The next question is, new patients cannot be started on opioids using telemedicine. That is accurate. Then next question is, this hopefully is the last question. We are running out of time. I have a few patients who are essential employees that cannot be on opioids. Is it reasonable to bring them into the office for epidurals and even the RFAs? For example, a patient who is a foster care social worker she drives for several hours a day and does well with an RFA. Is it reasonable to do her procedure or am I opening myself for liability and appropriate criticism by colleagues? Well, criticism may be appropriate or inappropriate, but you will be opening yourself to liability. Your malpractice coverage may not even provide you coverage unless you, you need to check with them. I'm not quite certain this counts as an emergency, but if it is, then you may be able to do it, semi-urgent or urgent, and also depends on your location where you are doing. Some places, offices are much easier than surgery centers and hospitals. And if this person was on opioids before, that would be okay to be on opioids again, but we don't want to start new opioids at this time. Next question is if you if you contact does not have contract does not have a force majeure contract, they cannot reduce your salary. It looks like that is an answer than question. So but it looks like it is an answer for the previous question. So okay, so we will close. Uh, thank you all, and everybody had a wonderful presentation, and it is great. We'll see you soon again. Thank you. Thank it's you so all, cute. and attend the next one. Very good. That's all the time we have for today. On behalf of ASAP, I'd like to thank all of our attendees for your participation. We'd also like to thank our speakers for the excellent presentation. At this time, if you could fill up the brief survey on your screen, we appreciate your feedback greatly. This concludes today's webinar. We hope you have a great day.